So what are we thinking of when we choose a career? How do we know that all those decisions we're making where we're applying for college education, where we're only 16 or 17 year old, years old, will actually match our expectations when we're adults? How do we know that that university training is actually going to prepare us for that job we anticipate? And most important of all, how would that job look like seven days a week, 40 hours a week? Imagine 40 hours a week doing the same thing. When we're kids, teenagers, and even adults, we spend a lot of time thinking about these things. For example, when I was a kid, I would spend hours and hours daydreaming about my adult self, how would I be, what I would become. And I used to watch my family members, my parents, my neighbors, my teachers, who went to work every day, they built their families, they made all those choices that I was supposed to do at some point of my life. When I became a teenager, I started to feel that that time was coming short, so a little bit of anxiety and uncertainty started to mingle. I believe that that anxiety and that uncertainty is related to the fact that we're usually educated to believe that all decisions are final. And if you change your mind, you're a kind of a failure. However, I believe that if you're able to make your own decision, then admit that you are not happy with it, and then act upon it and change whatever you need to change, you're actually going to be happier. So as adults, you're usually going to see people also reevaluating your past choices, thinking about that younger person who made all these decisions, and thinking about the adult you are today, and did you meet all the expectations you had? Are you happy with the life, the life you're leading? Would you make any changes? And if so, if you would make changes, would you see these changes as a little monster that, it's only, that are only going to get you into like uncertainty? Or do you see change as an empowering challenge? So I had no idea what archaeology was when I was a teenager thinking about all these things. I mean, I knew archaeology was, you know, about adventure in the jungle, finding lost temples, golden statues, adventure sweating, kind, like, kind of a cool outfit and all that. But I actually never really stopped to think about what archaeology as a science was. So I was only thinking about how I would experience archaeology. So there I was trying to figure out what is what this archaeology thing when I was in high school. And I was like, I don't remember how old I was, and an uncle of mine gave me a book and said, read this. Maybe you'll figure it out. And it was uh, Margaret Mead's coming of age in Samoa. I didn't even know where Samoa was. <laughs> And that idea was that, very simple, that the life and even the moral values of other people can be totally different to the ones that I took for granted. Then I started thinking, okay, so if societies that live on the same moment, on the same planet, have such different lifestyles, what about past societies? And more importantly, how these people experienced life? How were their lives like? How did they work? What did they experience their environment? And all questions like that. So all these questions started like mingling a little bit in my high school years. So when I graduated, I decided to materialize my dream. And I went to Israel to a site called Tsipori and I started excavating. And instead of the cool temples and the statues and all that, I saw that archaeology was one discipline, but actually was many different worlds. Because archaeology spent like thousands of hours studying, studying architecture. Yes. Study architecture, and they would also study bone and stone artifacts, and they would even study faunal remains and botanical remains. So archaeology was one discipline, but you could do a lot of things with it, and ceramics. And so I was walking on the side and finding all these little fragments of whatever there was. I asked my supervisor, "What is this?" They said, well, basically ceramics is like the broken plates and pots and ollas from Asian people. So basically ceramics are called kitchenware. You find the fragments of them. So I said, well, then, of course, I was picking one up. I said, okay, of course, we're going to throw them away. He said, totally important. We're trying to reconstruct people's lives and thoughts and society. And what do we care about what they cooked? And 
And of course, my supervisor said, hey, wait, 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 wait. And they came with a Ziploc bag with a tag with the numbers and codes, said we need to bag it because later in the afternoon, we're going to go to the lab and we're going to classify them. And there's going to be people even making drawings and pictures of them, writing little codes with ink. I was like, what is going on here? This is trash. And then I started thinking, why did I think that trash was unimportant? And most of all, why didn't I ever pay any attention to ceramics? Ceramics are everywhere. Think about the plate you eat your food from. Think about the coffee mug you're having your precious beverage from. Think about a brick house, a tile roof. Even think of your toilet, which you see every single day. So ceramics are everywhere. And then I thought, well, I never really paid attention either of the methods of archaeology. How does archaeology study? So I started saying, well, ceramics is something that archaeology studies. What is ceramics? And then I started researching, and ceramics are made of clay. And I can be very technical and tell you that clay is a fine-grained, earthly substance that when mixed with water, it's plastic. So basically, it's a type of soil produced by the, the composition of rocks that when mixed with water, you can make shapes with it. And if you think about ceramics, what are ceramics? What is the relationship between clay and ceramics? Very simple. You fire clay, you get ceramics. Simple as that. So ceramics can also be seen as, if you think about it, as a little bit of artificial rocks. Ceramics are among the first materials humankind has been modifying. We have been taking a part of our planet and we were been shaping it to serve our needs. Thank you. So going back to that, <laughs> kind of. So going back to that idea of the rocks. Of course, there's any geologists here in the audience. They're going to jump at the idea that I'm saying that ceramics are like man-made rocks. But if you play with the idea, it's kind of fun because you can say ceramics are made of minerals, which are the building blocks of rocks. And their manufacturing process also involves heat and pressure, which is how rocks are formed. So think about this, that humans, since the early stages of civilization, we have been shaping clay, like emulating in a little bit nature, trying to play to make these rocks that are actually transcending our own lifespan and serve as a window to study the past. So that's when I got to the question, so how do actually Archaeologists study ceramics. So, as you can see, we spend a lot of time in two different things. We have two ways, and the beautiful thing about these two ways is that they don't rule each other out, rather than they are complementary. So we look at ceramics macroscopically, meaning with our bare naked eye, without the help of any magnifying device, and we also look at them microscopically. About macroscopic, you can see here, we go to the lab and what we try to reconstruct, it's not only if it has beautiful paintings, if they had the representation of an ancient god or something like that, but more, we try to figure out the method, the technology behind it, the how did they make it? How did ancient potters actually <coughs> went and chose a clay and how did they process it? What did they do? Why? Because technology is a shared practice. It's something a community, would, they all would know about. I think about, I love stealing a metaphor from my teacher ceramics teacher, they would always compare ceramics with cooking. Think about when you make a cake. You go, you choose the right flour. If you're gluten intolerant, you're going to choose a different flour than if you're not. Then you're going to mix it with the ingredient. You're going to knead and you're going to pat your dough with your hands until you get the right consistency. Then you're going to preheat your oven. You're going to choose the right pan. If it's for the boyfriend, you're going to make a heart. If it's for the mom, you're going to make something else. And you're going to put it in the oven and then it's going to pop out with all the chemical like, process is going on, and then comes the glorious woman that eating your cake. With ceramics, it's a little bit more frustrating because after fire, you don't get to eat it, but you create plates that actually help you eat a cake, so it kind of lessens the frustration. So that's with, a, as with the cooking example, if you're a potter, you're going to have to choose a clay, and a clay for making a cooking oil oh, yeah, is not going to be the same as a clay, as a clay you're going to use for making a fancy plate. And then you're going to have to know how to process this. You're going to have to make choices. Do you want to roll the clay and then coil it up together to make your pot? Or are you going to use a mold that it's easier? Or are you going to create it from a slab? Imagine so many different choices. Then you're going to have to 
let it dry for a few days, because otherwise if you put it in a kiln after the no drying process, then it's going to explode into pieces. So you have to choose what are you going to do with the surface. You're going to have to choose if you're going to use a closed kiln or a bonfire. All these steps, and in different communities, they have different steps that allows us to reconstruct how societies work. So, and after, even think about it, and even after making your fog, you're going to have to choose, okay, is this like a fancy mug I'm only going to use for cer my ceremonies or like for the weekends, or is this going to be my regular cup? Think about the cake. You would never question that a cake is for eating. We would never question that a plate is for eating, either. But some cultures, they eat from a big plate, and they grab with their hands. We get our own individual plate. And that talks about how society shares food as well. So it's, a, it's more than what we can see. So once we're done with all these macroscopic, macroscopic things that we can see from ceramics, we go mi microscopic. And in that, I have to confess that the first time I saw ceramics under the microscope, actually this was the first time I saw ceramics under the microscope, I discovered like a whole new cosmos. I couldn't stop thinking that this resembled a lot like the Hubble Space Telescope pictures, it's like a little universe. And the only time in my life I have ever felt anything like this is when I first scuba dive. Because the first time I went in deep into the ocean, I started seeing plants i never heard of, plants I've never even like read in books. I would see colors, pink, purple, green, that I didn't think they were possible in nature. So the first time I saw this, and I actually was instructed that the different, all the different colorful dots that you see, they're minerals, that they have distinct shapes that we can identify. They have optical properties that we can also recognize. Even, for example, if the potter made those rolls that they coiled to make the pot, the minerals are going to go into a range in a circular way that I will be able to identify. So seeing it through the microscope, I will be able to reconstruct how actually a potter touched and worked with the clay. So microscopy can go so many places. Sorry about that. But the beautiful thing about archaeology is that it's a science of people. So if archaeologists only focus on the objects and we forget that we're actually trying to study the societies through their objects and not the... something called ethnoarchaeology, in which, I, in my case, that I work with ceramics, I go with the modern potters. In Latin America, we have communities, living communities of potters, who still develop the traditional craft. So that's a gold mine for us, because we can actually get to go to the river with the potter, and he chooses, or she, they choose this clay, and you wonder, but why don't you use that one? That one is better. Just because my grandma used to use it, and I was taught to use that and all your hypotheses, but that one has more plasticity and the minerals are better, they don't work. Because some of the choices we make when we're doing, when we're sharing these practices, some of those choices are tradition. Some of those choices are related to religion. So it's amazing that we can actually talk with the potters and experience that. Also, there's something else that pottery allows us, or certain archaeological pottery, and it's like we have time to play at the lab. What is that? That we have something called experimental archaeology. So if we, we have all these hypotheses about how they roll, roll the clay and coin. This one. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So if we have all these hypotheses, for example, that we say, okay, I think I'm looking at the microscope and I think they were firing the clay at 800 degrees Celsius, so I get to go to a lab. First, I go to the field, I collect the clay, I talk to the potters, then I go to the lab, I fire it at different temperatures, then I cut it out, I check it under the microscope, and I can actually confirm or not if it was fired at that temperature or not. So, of course, I had no idea when I was a teenager what archaeology was really about or how many worlds I could discover. It taught me to first be more observant of my surroundings, it taught me to start looking at all the materials we transform on a daily basis and we don't even think about. It also showed me that there's something called alternate realities. There's people who are choosing at this moment and on our planet, they're choosing to live their lives in a very different way. And some of them, like... 
and some of them, like the communities of potters, they're choosing to live lives that are much more sustainable and friend, like friendly to our nature than we would ever know. So now that it's so trendy to be sustainable and conservation and all that, we should look at these traditional communities that are actually living their lives for centuries like that. So we don't have to go very far to look at that. So I would say that even if you don't know very much what you want when you're 16 or you're 17, even if you are already studying or you're an adult trying to check your past choices and to see if you're happy or not with them, I would advise you to see how much they still challenge you. When I got the invitation from Isaac to talk here, I was scared because I've never done this. I'm used to, you know, talk about in conferences or give a lecture at college, but I'm not used to talk to the public about really what, what is my passion, passion what, is my, what were the, all, the, all these challenges that I had to face when I had to choose my career, and how it shaped me in many, many ways, and how I changed with it. So if you are thinking about your future, if I would tell you to not use a microphone, and also... I will tell you to check how much this decision, the decisions that they have made, they challenge you, how much they intimidate you. Because if they don't scare you, if they don't shake you, if they don't push you to do things that are out of your box, then you should recheck, reevaluate, and push yourself, and you can be a happier and happier person.